Last week, we discussed the young life of one of the most infamous serial killers in history. What was it, if anything, from his childhood that led him to commit the horrible crimes that he did? Was this a case of nature versus nurture? Could a different young life have led Ted Bundy in a different direction? Today, we'll look further than his childhood and into the world of a serial killer. This is A Brief History of Ted Bundy. As always, this episode of A Brief History contains graphic content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Ted Bundy was born on November 24th, 1946, but we're not here to discuss his childhood or early life today. If you're curious about that aspect of Ted Bundy's life, please refer to part one of this video in the card listed above. In the previous video, we left off at the point in Bundy's life where he met what he referred to as the woman of his dreams. In 1967, Bundy met a girlfriend who would forever change his life. They seemed perfect for each other, sharing the same interests, passions, and ideals. Bundy made it a point to try to continually impress her, leading him to frequently exaggerate his accomplishments to the point of nonsense. Eventually, Bundy found that juggling a girlfriend, part-time jobs, and university was too much to bear, and ended up dropping out of school. After dropping out, Bundy's girlfriend found herself less than impressed with her boyfriend's lack of ambition, and dumped him before moving back to her parents' home in California. Depressed, Bundy began traveling, and it is speculated that it was around this time that he also learned of his true parentage. The woman he had believed was his sister his entire life was actually his mother. The perfect storm of two tragedies was more than Bundy could bear, and it seems as if something inside him snapped. Ted Bundy did manage to find another girlfriend who states that she fell, quote, deeply in love with Bundy, and she would stick around for much of his life. But it seems as though he didn't share her feelings consistently putting off any conversation of marriage, stating that it just didn't interest him. During this time, Ted Bundy was involved with a re-election campaign for the Republican governor of Washington, and was seemingly doing well for himself. Ted's newfound ambition caught the eye of the girl who had gotten away, and despite being involved with his new girlfriend, the pair apparently reunited, neither woman really knowing about each other. In January of 1974, Ted Bundy broke all contact with his reunited love. The woman, later in life, realized that Ted had orchestrated the entire reunification and had planned from the get-go to court her again just to reject her. By April of the same year, Ted dropped out of law school and women began to go missing. There is no one correct answer on when Ted Bundy began assaulting and killing women. But the murder of 18-year-old Karen Sparks in January of 1974 is thought to be the earliest truly documented, while others remain speculative. Around midnight, Ted Bundy entered the woman's home, where he bludgeoned her with a metal rod. He eventually used the same metal rod to sexually assault her, causing extensive internal injuries. Karen Sparks survived after being unconscious for 10 days but not without permanent physical and mental disabilities. Just a month later, Ted Bundy broke into the home of Linda Ann Healy, where he beat her until she was unconscious and then kidnapped her. For the next six months, Ted Bundy assaulted, kidnapped, and killed young female college students seemingly once per month at various college campuses in the Pacific Northwest. There were few common denominators in the cases, but sheriff's departments were becoming increasingly concerned at the disappearances of young white female college students with their hair parted down the middle, later thought to be an homage to Ted Bundy's lost love. Ted Bundy's luck would start to run out on June 11th when he abducted George Ann Hawkins, a University of Washington student, while she was walking down a brightly lit alleyway between her boyfriend's dorm and her sorority house. Once Hawkins' disappearance was made public, multiple witnesses came forward to describe the man she was last seen speaking to. One witness saying that he was on crutches with a leg cast carrying a briefcase. 
Yet another stated the man asked her to carry his briefcase to a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. The abductions continued, with more and more witnesses able to describe Bundy, even having heard him introduce himself to people as Ted. The police department finally had enough for a composite sketch and sent it out to the community, hanging flyers, printing in newspapers, and broadcasting on local television stations. Someone even called in to the tip line to point out Ted Bundy as a possible suspect. But with hundreds of tips coming in, why would the police investigate a seemingly clean-cut law student? Bundy began feeling the pressure and instead of sticking around to get caught, moved himself and his crimes to Utah in August of 1974 after being accepted to the University of Utah Law School. The string of abductions would continue in Utah where he had beaten, raped, sodomized, and strangled women with nylon stockings. After being caught, Bundy eventually confessed that during this string of abductions and murders, he would shampoo his deceased victim's hair, as well as apply makeup to their corpses. On November 8, 1974, Ted Bundy was at the Fashion Place Mall in Murray, Utah, where he approached 18-year-old Carol DeRanche to tell her that someone had tried to break into her car, and he offered to let her join him in going to the police station to file a report by posing as an off-duty police officer. Durant agreed and got into the car, but when she noticed they weren't going to a police station, despite being cuffed at this point, Durant managed to get the car door open and escape from the car. It is said that after the incident with Durant that Ted Bundy removed the door handles from his interior passenger side to prevent an escape like this from happening again. And the abductions and murders continued until August of 1975. On August 16, 1975, Ted Bundy was arrested in Granger, Utah, after being seen slowly driving through a residential area in the very early morning. He was then spotted fleeing the area at high speeds when noticing the patrol car in the area. After being pulled over, the officer searched his car and found a number of questionable items, including rope, an ice pick, pantyhose, handcuffs, and more. Bundy tried to explain the presence of the items, but was met with obvious scrutiny from the officer. Unfortunately, they didn't have enough information to hold Bundy, and he was released, but put under 24-hour surveillance. During the surveillance, detectives visited his old girlfriend that he had left in Seattle, who claimed that while living with Bundy, she found many objects that were simply unexplainable in their shared apartment including crutches, bags of plaster of Paris clearly used for making his fake casts, and sacks full of women's clothing. She also described that Bundy had become abusive, threatening to kill her over trivial things like parting her hair differently. In September of 1975, Bundy sold his infamous beetle to a teenager in Utah, and it was almost immediately impounded and searched by FBI technicians, who found hairs matching those of some of his victims, including Karen Campbell and Carol DeRanche. Bundy was eventually put into a lineup and identified by Carol DeRanche. Ted Bundy was arrested and charged with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault against Carol. The $15,000 bail was paid for by Bundy's parents, who continued to profess his innocence during all of his trials, and he moved back in with his ex-girlfriend. In February of 1976, Bundy stood trial for the kidnapping and was sentenced to 1 to 15 years for kidnapping and assault. Bundy was found in the yard of the prison with an escape kit, foreshadowing what was to come. In June of 1977, Bundy escaped from a courthouse library by jumping out of a second-story window and running to freedom. He went missing for six days before being picked up by officers. It was speculated that his escape had been planned due to him being in a close enough location to visit the dumping site of one of his earlier victims. His next escape would happen in the December of 1977, after having spent time in his evenings creating a hole in the ceiling of his cell. Ted Bundy crawled through the makeshift crawl space and broke through the ceiling of the jailer's apartment. The jailer was out with his wife for the evening, so Bundy changed into some of his street clothes and simply walked out the front door, making his second escape. 
The escape went unnoticed until almost a full day later, due to the low number of workers at the jail over Christmas time. And by the time it was discovered that Bundy was gone, he had already made it to Chicago. Ted Bundy finally arrived in Florida in January of 1978. On January 15, 1978, Bundy broke into the Chai Omega sorority house in Tallahassee, Florida, through the back door which had a broken lock. In the early hours of the morning, Bundy attacked four women living in the sorority house within the span of 15 minutes. Margaret Bowman was bludgeoned and garroted with a nylon stocking. Lisa Levy was beaten unconscious, strangled, and sexually assaulted with a bottle. Kathy Kleiner had her jaw broken and a deep laceration to her shoulder. And Karen Chandler had a concussion, loss of teeth, and a broken jaw. There were more than 30 witnesses within earshot of all four women and no one heard a thing. Bundy left the sorority house as quietly as he came and broke into a basement apartment where he fractured the jaw and skull of another Florida State University student, Cheryl Thomas. More assaults, disappearances, and murders were reported until Bundy was caught driving a stolen Volkswagen Beetle and was promptly arrested. Bundy resisted, kicking the officer and almost fleeing until the officer fired a warning shot and tackled Bundy to the ground. The officer at this point simply believed he had caught a car thief and had no idea that he had captured America's most wanted suspect. And on the ride to the jail, Bundy stated, I wish you had killed me. Ted Bundy stood trial for the deaths and assaults at Chai Omega in June of 1979, and Bundy was offered a plea deal. He would plead guilty and serve a firm 75-year sentence, instead of being handed the death penalty that was so common in Florida courts. Bundy was disgusted at the thought of a plea deal and refused. He couldn't bring himself to tell the world he was actually guilty. Bundy was found guilty on three counts of attempted first-degree murder, two counts of burglary, and for the deaths of two victims, which he received the death sentence for both. During his second trial in Florida, he was found guilty for the abduction and murder of Kimberly Leach. During his sentencing for the trial, Bundy claimed bizarrely that any marriage declarations in court were considered valid and married his former co-worker Carol Ann Boone in a bizarre scene. In February of 1980, Bundy was given yet another death sentence. Over a year later, Carol Ann Boone gave birth to a daughter, despite not being legally allowed conjugal visits. It is thought that Bundy and Carol bribed guards into allowing them to spend some alone time together. The daughter has never had her true name or identity revealed and does wish to remain anonymous. On death row, Bundy gave many interviews to many individuals, notably the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit. But in interviews, Bundy frequently spoke in third person, seemingly as though he could discuss his crimes without taking accountability for said crimes. Bundy confessed to many things while on death row, including murders that had not been previously linked to him. He discussed his post-mortem activities with his victims, and how he believed he grew from an amateur impulsive killer to a prime predator. Despite appeals, stays, and questions of clemency, Ted Bundy was eventually put to death on January 24, 1989, by electric chair. Bundy was cremated and his ashes were spread in an undisclosed location in Washington State. There is, of course, so much more to the Ted Bundy story and the stories of his victims, but with only so much time, I did what I could. Ted Bundy has been purported to be one of the most infamous and fascinating serial killers of recent times. What is it that makes him such an interesting subject to study? What fascinates you most about the Ted Bundy case that may not have been mentioned in this series of videos? Leave your comments below. Thank you for joining me for another episode of A Brief History. Thank you to my patrons and my channel members for keeping this series going. You are much appreciated. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more true crime Sims content every Friday or Saturday. Stay safe and I'll see you next time.